today we have Mary Yost as our speaker. Mary is back home at Columbus CEO Magazine. She was appointed editor in 2014, and this completes a circle that began when she started working as a reporter for the Columbus Dispatch while studying journalism at Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. Her two journalism careers bookend a stint in public relations and communications for a statewide trade group called the Ohio Hospital Association. She has spent her entire adult life in two adjacent downtown buildings. First for the dispatch, which is on 3rd Street there, and then the Ohio Hospital Association was right next door in the PNC building next to the dispatch, and now she's back in the dispatch building with the dispatch magazine group. So Mary, I'm just curious, can you like look out your window and spy on all your old coworkers uh, over yes. there, see what they're doing? Um, as editor, Mary assigns and edits stories for the magazine, overseeing content and assures accuracy and relevance of all articles. Um, when time and opportunity allow her, she even gets to write, which is her real passion. At Columbus CEO, her focus is to provide context, depth, analysis, and profiles to help Central Ohio businesses and community leaders better understand today's news and forecast tomorrow's trends. Mary lives in Gehanna. She enjoys cooking and is married to her high school sweetheart. And she has her three favorite G's, which are gardening, golf, and grandsons, Dodge and Logan, who are five and three. Mary says she thinks journalism has been in her blood since she was a toddler and insisted on sleeping with a red crayon. So Mary, if you'll come up here with your crayon and let us welcome you as our Columbus Rotary speaker today. It is, um, it's been a little while since I've been with Columbus Rotary. I think about four years, Scott could probably tell me for sure, but it was before you were meeting in this location, and this is a really nice location. So things have changed for you, things have changed for me, and I want to take a little bit of time today to kind of look back from the, the perspective of those two different journalism careers on how much has changed in the, the news business. So I hope it will be uh, interesting, maybe bring back some memories for all of you as well. And as I share some observations from these early days in journalism, I just want you to keep one thing in mind. I was a child when I started at the Dispatch. It was um, in 1973, and they kept me on after while I finished up my degree and for 19 years. So I would also like to say that I owe a, um, some thanks to Rotarian Bob Smith, who gave me that opportunity of that first job in journalism. And I just want to say thanks, Bob, for believing in me enough to, to kind of launch that first career. Now, I think most of you would probably agree with me that the 70s, the 1970s, weren't really that long ago. It was, it was just like yesterday, I think, to, to a lot of us. And I, I want to paint a picture for you, if I could, of what it was like in those early 70s, 1973, when I walked into the dispatch newsroom for the first time. So it, it was, as Mike said, it was the same building where I work today, but um, things have changed quite a bit. So, so back at that time, they had one of my first impressions of the paper was that um, it had not been that long since they had covered the tile on the floor of the old newsroom and they had put down carpet. And reporter Ned Stout, who was just, um, an amazing journalist, and some of you may remember Ned, was upset still when I was there in 73 that he couldn't grind his cigarettes out on the, the tile floor anymore. That just wouldn't work very well with the carpet. Um, and back in that time, we were, we were still using typewriters and carbon paper. And um, I wanted to show you, you know, kind of here is back in the day, 
with Ned Stout, and some of you may, may still remember John Schweitzer. He still writes a weather column that appears in the, the Sunday Dispatch. Uh, he's there on the right, and Jim Bradshaw, who was one of my colleagues uh, toward the end of my dispatch career, is in that picture also. But yes, we, we did use the manual typewriters. That was one of the, the changes that was new when I walked in in 73. They, the dispatch had invested in some new technology and they were using IBM Selectrix. So we were still using the carbon paper and the editors were marking up our copy with red pens and, and all of that. So it was still very much, you know, you talk about ink on paper, it was ink on paper from the beginning to the end of the process back then. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of some of the, the tools and the skills that are important in the news business and kind of compare then and now. And, and you might think that all of this has changed, but um, not everything. So if we can just kind of look back a little bit. Back in the day, you know, we used telephones were important news gathering devices and the old rotary dial phones, the landlines were what we had then. We still use telephones, they're important, but now they're, they're cell phones, we don't have to carry around a pocket full of quarters or dimes to, and find a pay phone, and the cell phones take uh, pictures and even video. So yeah, we, we're still using the phone. Um, sometimes, back in those early days, we used tape recorders as well. And they were pretty bulky things. They, they didn't work so well if you were covering a breaking news story and you were out in the field because they were just too big to carry around. Now, we have these darn cute little devices that are so powerful, but the digital recorders do it all. So, so that's you know another tool that's changed a little bit. Uh, in the, I'm thinking mid to, to late 1970s, Bob may, may remember more on this, the exact date, but um, the dispatch got a couple of room-sized computers. These things were huge, and my understanding is that, that we used these computers to, to help gather some of the wire services um, reporting and that sort of thing. And one of my jobs back at that time, I was working nights, 3 to 11 in those days, and one of my jobs was to um, make sure that if I left at night and someone else hadn't done it, these computers had to be turned on. We, for some reason that I don't remember, we called the computers Ozzie and Harriet, because there were two of them. And there, there would be a few times that I would get about halfway home and realize that I'd forgotten to turn on Ozzie and Harriet and I would have to go back downtown and, and back into the paper to make sure that they were turned on. Now, in those early years, if we were gathering background on a new subject, person, or, or business, we had a couple of tools. We had the old crisscross directories, if you remember those. Um, and we had the yellow pages. We actually used phone books, and sometimes we had our own paper files in um, what we called the morgue, which is newspaper talk for library. And now it's, it's all about Google, it's all about databases, it's all digital and online. So the, the tools for gathering that information are very different. Um, so as I look back, it was a lot of fun for 19 years at the paper. I, I started after that general assignment at night shift. I covered the, the southeastern Franklin County suburbs from Bexley to Whitehall to Canal Winchester, Pickerington, and um, I'm missing one, Obetz was out in there. And um, then after I covered that, they brought me back inside and I covered the county courts for a little while. One of the biggest stories that I had then, some of you may remember, there was a, a very well-respected Eastside physician, Dr. Edward Franklin Jackson, Jr., who was arrested as a serial rapist, and it was the most 
bizarre story. I mean, you can't make up stories like some of the ones that I covered, but they, they learned at the time that they indicted Dr. Jackson that another man, also ironically named Jackson, was in prison serving time for some of the rapes that Dr. Jackson had actually committed. Um, I just heard from our, one of our library folks last week at the dispatch that Dr. Jackson's parole hearing is coming up in 2019. I thought he was put away forever, but um, anyhow, great, great story. Then I got to, after the courts, I covered county government for a little while and had a lot of fun um, uncovering, there were a lot of secretive land deals that were going on out, out east as Les Wexner was buying up land for the redevelopment of New Albany. And so that was one of the, the fun things I covered with county government. We were calling it Wexley back then. They, that name didn't stick. It's, it's New Albany. So again, um, I loved working at the paper. I got to have the great privilege of being the first woman state house reporter for the dispatch the, the last four years that I was there. And I think I would have stayed there forever. I was looking forward then to being a member of the, what they call the quarter century club. Hopefully I can still get there. Um, but the Ohio Hospital Association lured me away all the way next door, as Mike mentioned to come and work in, in public affairs. And at that time, my 40th birthday was approaching, and I thought, I'm not looking to make a change, but I may not get another opportunity like this. So I said goodbye for a little while to my friends at the dispatch and had a lot of fun doing the, the hospital public affairs thing. Now, while I was doing that, um, I wasn't really away from the media all that time. The, as, as I look at what was going on at that time, we, we still didn't have the internet. That, that wasn't something that we were all using as a tool. We didn't, you know, when I went to OHA, we had no website. And people were not, um, you know, the, the newsrooms, use of computers was pretty much for the, the production side of things, for the word processing side of things. We still weren't using computers the way that, that we are today with the internet and all of that. Nobody was Googling anybody then. And um, it was starting to change though. It was a very, very different world you know, when I walked into Columbus CEO in January of this year. Now, during the time that I was gone, I wasn't totally away from the news media because part of my job at OHA was to be the media spokesperson for the hospital association. So I was talking to media from across the state. I was still in contact with many of my dispatch colleagues, and I knew their world was changing. I knew that what was developing was what we now know as the 24-hour news cycle. The, the whole concept of deadlines is very fuzzy. It used to be that, that we knew a couple of select times during the day that we were on deadline. And you know, once you, you got your story turned in and the deadline passed, you could kind of relax for a minute, start thinking maybe about the next day. That's not the case today. The, the deadlines are constant. So we, we are seeing print reporters who are doing um, stand-ups in front of the TV cameras, and the dispatch even has a small TV studio right in the newsroom. Here is, um, in this picture, John Schwandis, who is the kind of the, the, the bridge for the dispatch between broadcast and print, is helping with the microphone for Daryl Rowland, who is the public affairs editor. So that is something that, you know, on a daily basis, they are shooting video and hooking up with WBNS right from the dispatch newsroom. Also, um, before I came back to, to journalism, reporters were more and more using Twitter as a tool to distribute the news. There, I, I was talking to one of my friends one time who, um, 
she had an editor who was upset because some of the reporters weren't coming back to the newsroom when news was breaking to file their stories for the paper. They were getting on their phones and tweeting the news out. And he thought, well, we need to get the news out. And it's like that's what they were doing. They were just doing it in 140 characters or less. So we've, we've gone from all the news that's fit to print to what can you get in 140 characters. But that is a, a big news distribution channel. Um, so with, with all of that, the situation that we're in today with Columbus CEO is that we are more than just a monthly magazine, but I also want to tell you a little bit about the monthly magazine. So by a show of hands, do most of you get the magazine already? Well, that's pretty good. I, I did bring some extra copies that are back on the table and some sign-up cards. So, so please grab one of those when you get a chance. Columbus CEO is a monthly business-focused magazine. And it has been um, published for 23 years. And the Dispatch has owned the magazine for about, well, since the spring of 2012. So it has not been a Dispatch property for a long time. But I do want to share with you, it is an award-winning publication just this year. We won an award for most improved publication, and this was a national award by the um, Ameri or Alliance of Area Business Publishers. So they looked, they compared the magazine, two different issues from 2012 to 2013, and they said, this is the most improved publication. So my, since I had nothing to do with those issues, my goal now is to win that award again when they look at from 2013 to 2014. So we'll see how that goes. And um, also our assistant editor, Kitty McConnell, was is going to be recognized this coming weekend by the Ohio chapters of the Society for of Society of Professional Journalists for Best Business Reporting. So you can um, pick up our magazine in Barnes and Noble, but most people get it for free just by by either being in a membership organization that will share the membership roster by filling out one of those cards or by going online. And there's an address on the screen for if you don't get the magazine already and you want to sign up online, you can get it there. The, the other dispatch magazines in our group are Columbus Monthly that um, was also acquired by the dispatch a few years ago, Capital Style, which the dispatch um, grew that magazine from scratch, Columbus Bride, Crave, which is a great food magazine, also an original dispatch property, and then the Columbus Monthly Home and Garden. So it's, um, I, I saw one of my former newsroom colleagues shortly after I had started uh, back at the, at the, in the building, and I saw her on the stairwell, and she said, now, now where are you in the building? And I said, well, I'm on the third floor with the magazine group. And she said, oh, you're down there with all the cool kids. And they are. I mean, the, the, um, the folks who are in the, the magazine group are a lot of just really um, starting out, you know, new journalists. They're, they're very ambitious. They're very creative. And it's, it's a great place to be. Now, the, the biggest difference for me, coming into the, the magazine side after having worked on that daily newspaper side is the time frame. So probably some of you are maybe still kind of warming up to the idea that yes, it is October already. And you know that might be a little bit hard to, to process sometimes. But for me, I need to be thinking about February. We're right now, we are processing copy for our December issue the January issue stories are mostly already assigned, and I need to start thinking about February to make sure that, that we've got the, the writers and the stories lined up for that issue. Another way to um, kind of illustrate that time frame is when I walked into the office for the first time on January 6th, which was the, that horrible cold polar vortex day. I mean, it was nasty cold my first day in the office. And 
my first assignment was to start editing the copy for the March issue. So that's, that's how far in advance we work. The, the thing that we're trying to do then as a monthly publication is we don't have the luxury of covering the news that's breaking right now, getting it into print and then moving on. We have to be thinking out and thinking what's going to still be fresh? What's still going to be interesting three months from now? So I, I think we did it pretty well in the November issue. If, you, if you've seen that issue, we've got, um, it's, it's election season. We've got the, a kind of a political theme going with this issue. It's also, November is the month that Mayor Mike Coleman turns 60. So we've got a nice interview with him and uh, we've got a big story inside about the business of politics. So hopefully, even though we've planned this issue a while ago, as you're looking through it, hopefully it's feeling fresh to you. That's my goal. So we, um, one of the things that was kind of cool was um, last week, the dispatch even took note of our interview with the mayor and said, oh, if you've seen what the mayor told Columbus CEO, it looks like maybe he's thinking about running again because he told us that as he prepares to turn 60, it feels more like 40 to him and that this job that he has is the best political office in America. So sounds like somebody who's not thinking of retiring to me. Now, for our December issue, um, again, we're processing that copy now, and those of you in the nonprofit community will want to make sure you take note of our question and answer with Doug Kreidler of the Columbus Foundation. We've got uh, a little bit of a, he promises me it will be a scoop. He won't be announcing this before we get it in print, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. You have to wait for the magazine. But there, there's gonna be good news for the, for or for the nonprofit community. So as I look at, at what we do and your other sources for business news in Columbus, some people have said, especially when I first started, that, well, Columbus CEO is competing with business first. And I don't really see it that way. We, we do some of the, the same kinds of recognition events, but I think that's pretty much where the, the competition ends. They are a weekly paper. They are trying to keep up with the dispatch daily business reporting, and they're kind of chasing that daily deadline. We're trying to work to provide you with context and maybe some appreciation for what's going on in the business community, stories that will help you better understand some of the breaking news stories, and just a little bit more of that depth, something that, that you can pick up and, and you know, spend a little time reading and ponder. And so I, I hope that we're doing that. If, um, you know, the other thing, and, and I'll just say one last thing, I don't wanna go into our various features. Hopefully if, if you've seen the magazine, you're familiar with some of our, our regular features, our, our breakdown, um, infographics, we do spotlights that are not unlike rotary spotlights. They're you know, a spotlight usually on a particular business. And we're gonna be doing more of those beginning in January for commercial real estate, so that'll be fun. But um, the main thing that, that I would like to leave with you in terms of the magazine and, and my role with it is each month I wanna make sure that the stories in there are stories that I wanna read that they're interesting, that they're well-written, well-researched, and that we, we don't have any uh, throwaway stories. I, I want them to all be the best that they can be. So I appreciate any and all feedback. If you can let me know if we're hitting that mark or what we could do better to hit that mark. So that, that's the print magazine. The, the big world, big new world out there though, is the, the online world. And so for, for those of you who like to, to access your news on your smartphone or on your, your laptop or your computer at your desk, there's a lot to offer online as well. We, we've got a website with all of the various um, tabs that you can click on to find some of our previous stories. And the, 
you know, we do have that that 24-hour news cycle. So if there is something that's breaking, we have links to the wire services that we can post some of those major breaking stories on our website as well. So we, we can be a little bit more of that up-to-date resource for you. And the other thing that you may not know is that while we're, we're putting information out there on the web, we're watching to see how that information is being accessed. How many people are looking at a website at any given time? And this is something that the dispatch does even more than we do. So um, they shared some figures recently with others in the newsroom about their um, unique visitors to the dispatch website in the month of September. 3.1 million unique visitors, that's, you know, different email addresses that were accessing the dispatch website just in that month. It was a 48% increase. For, for Columbus CEO, um, our numbers are not quite like that. The dispatch might have 1,500 people on their website at any one time, and we have more like 100 at any one time on our website. But hey, if all of you got on you know, columbusceo.com, that would boost our numbers way up and the digital editor would be very happy with me. The, um, so the, the Dispatch, even though it's a print product, it's also a prolific producer of videos. And d during the month of September, they had something like um, their videos were viewed 87,000 times. So you may think of the dispatch as a daily print product that lands on your doorstep every morning or maybe shows up on your desk, but they're producing a lot of video work too and getting a lot of attention to that. And then also Facebook is a big distribution channel for dispatch content. They, they watch their, their Facebook likes and they started out the year with 32,000 likes on Facebook. It kind of sounds like they're a you know, high school student or something, doesn't it? But they, they track their likes, and they are very pleased that they're now up to 60,000 likes on the Dispatch uh, Facebook page. So this is interesting, but you know, maybe you think, so what? You know, what difference does it make? Who's looking at, at what on a news website? But the truth is it makes a lot of difference. In um, talking to managing editor Gary Kiefer last week as I was getting ready to talk to you all, he was telling me that the dispatch is monitoring the web use constantly. They're looking at it throughout the day and they're making decisions on what, will be, what stories will be placed on the front page the next day they're making decisions about what stories they're going to be emailing out in the afternoon updates that they send out, and even, story, even decisions about what stories they continue to cover based on what is being looked at, what is being searched for on their website. So um, I bet most of you can guess what the the major search terms were last week on the Dispatch website? Right, Ebola and Ohio. Those were, were getting um, all the traffic. That's what everybody wanted to, to read about was what's going on, what is the Dispatch reporting about Ebola and Ohio. Now when I looked at their site Friday afternoon, and you probably won't be able to um, actually see this on the slide. This, this is a, just a snapshot of what that daily um, reporting looks like. And this changes by the minute. But you can tell, um, I think this one is the Columbus CEO one. So up in, the, in that top left-hand corner, there's 113 people at the moment that I captured this slide that were looking at the Columbus CEO website. And, um, or that might be the dispatch one. Anyhow, the, when I was looking at the dispatch website on Friday to, to capture a, a picture of it for you, the, the tool that they use to track the web traffic, 
the search terms were all Ohio State football. So that's probably no surprise either. But those, those are the kinds of things that editors in the newsroom can use so that they're not guessing about what it is that the public's looking for. They, they've got good information to say, here is actually what the public is looking for. So we do um, a little bit of the same kind of thing with Columbus CEO. Oh, I'm sorry, there's ours. I, I think we had more than seven people on our website at that time. I'm, again, I, I'm just starting to look at some of this data, so don't hold me to the interpretation. But, but we have data like this that we look at also. Ours we look at more for trends over time because we're not making daily coverage decisions, but this gives us good trends over time, so we look at it more on a monthly basis for Columbus CEO. So all of this is, is to go to say that, yes, we're, you know, we're putting out products that are ink on paper. We're putting out a nice magazine that, you know, it feels good. It's got a nice glossy cover. You can put it on your coffee table and pick it up when you feel like it. We're putting out the daily dispatch. But a lot of the effort is driving people to the websites. So we're doing things that, you know, the daily updates, we're doing video, but um, just, just to wrap up, a lot has changed in journalism from the time I was an intern at the dispatch to the time that I came back 40 years later. And, but some key principles of journalism have not changed. So to leave you with those, what um, one of the things is that any, any publication, print and other, other journalists, we have to maintain our credibility. That's not changed. Especially with the, the bloggers and you know, the other quasi-journalists that are out there vying for your attention, we need to make sure that, that you know that the information you're getting from us, you can rely on. We also have to practice good news gathering skills. We have to know where to find the stories, we have to have multiple sources. We need to disclose those sources and the resources to you so that, that you know that we're doing what we need to be doing on the news gathering side. And we have to have good writing, editing, and organizational skills because nobody wants to stumble over misspellings or poor grammar or get you know, buffeted around in a story because it's organized poorly. So, you know, if we can make the words sing and paint a clear picture for you, then that's even better. And then beyond the words, we have to tell the stories with photos, with illustrations, with graphics, and with layouts that add to your understanding and the context of the stories. So those are things that I learned as a young journalist and that I hope to continue practicing as an old journalist. Now, be, before I get ready to answer any questions, if we still have a couple minutes for questions, um, I would like to invite you to sign up if you don't already receive our weekly e-newsletter. It's just a, a quick email that I send out on Tuesday mornings, and I'm having a lot of fun with writing it. it um, last week was my pumpkin issue because everything is pumpkin these days, so I, I haven't figured out yet what tomorrow's focus is. That's my next task after I leave here today. But um, you can sign up and get the e-newsletter right in your inbox. So if you um, have story ideas for me, if you have questions on, on any of our coverage, anything that feedback you think I need to know, here's how to contact me. And now, what questions can I answer? I'm sorry. I enjoyed your presentation and thank you for the information, but I have a question. <coughs> uh, since you literally turned on the computer at the dispatch in <coughs> 74 or 5, I think you said, <coughs> has, has writing in the contemporary sense of daily or weekly fundamentally changed? <coughs> and I'll just draw this analogy. If you turn on any of the evening news shows, and I realize that's not writing, 
And then I go back to Walter Cronkite because I was in the draft move, movement at the time he was reporting. <clears throat> I think there's a fundamental difference in what you see in new information that's produced publicly. Yeah, and, and I think probably it was even, um, it was not even computers as much as USA Today. I mean, that, that was kind of the phenomenon that in journalism kind of opened our eyes, the success of that national newspaper, that they did the quick hits and the, the short stories, you know, get all of the information right up front, front quicker. I think that was what really changed the writing. So it's, you know, back when, when I got into journalism and I could look up to a reporter like Ned Stout and just his beautiful style of writing, I don't think that, that journalists for the daily paper have the, the luxury of being able to do that, that beautiful writing that they once did. I mean, some columnists did. Mike Harden was a great columnist, but um, now it's a lot of quick hits. And even, even in the magazine, we, you know, we try to get to things quickly and because we know attention spans are short and you're not going to read the rest of the story if we don't catch you right at the top. So one more? Mary, uh, I'd just like to confirm a rumor that was spread by Judge, uh, the late Judge Frank Rita. Uh, he said that there was this young dispatch reporter <clears throat> that was so eager to get the news that at the, the monthly judges conference <laughs> they opened the door and found you there on your knees listening at the keyhole. <laughs> no, I wasn't listening at the keyhole. I actually, um, I decided I thought it was a public meeting. And my recollection was that before one of those meetings started that I went in the room and I picked a chair and sat down and Craig Wright came in and he was furious because I had sat in his chair and so I offered to get up, and he, no, 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 but he sulked the whole time after that. So, so I didn't get to cover all the judges' meetings, but I did cover a few of them. Thanks, John. <laughs> Are we done? Thank you, Mary, very much. We have a lovely gift from thank Argo you. and Laney. Oh, Enjoy thank it. You. And please come back often as our guest and maybe a returning member. <laughs> now you all go out there and make some news this week as Rotarians. Thank you very much.